Robert Clausen is a poet who comes from Acton, Massachusetts. He has performed his poetry for live radio and TV audiences here and over in Europe as well. He has been an editor of professional books and manuscripts and his own poetry has been published in a number of journals as well. He has been a teacher for students between the ages of 10 and 80 and he has provided a number of poetry workshops in different settings throughout his life. Back in time of interest uh, also he had performed with poet Anne Sexton and her band and had a very uh, wonderful way of uh, showing the world how poetry and music can fuse together and make great beauty and uh, evoke interest in our world through that, the, the mix of the art forms. Also, for you to know about Bob, uh, he, he has been involved in the past in a committee called the Better Use of Air, which was the first Boston Kite Festival. <coughs> he wrote the first brochure for fundraising for Boston's first night. He took part in an event of the art known as the Invisible City Situation entitled also Impossible Library, which also included the mix of musicians, sculptors, artists, and dancers over at the Forest Hills Cemetery, one of its kind in those days, and it drew hundreds from all over. So uh, there is a great deal of vision and creativity, innovation, when it comes to Bob and his circles and what he makes happen around him. I had asked Bob what he learned from working with community and his response was patience and saying that it sometimes takes a number of years for an idea to percolate and finally to come to fruition in bringing events of the arts to community. It's easier to launch projects faster. Volunteers naturally have other lives so the evening job can't be the top priority but that doesn't change the quality of work or the fun we have doing it. And the best contribution is the number of people I've met over the past 14 years. And uh, he went on to note that they have become fast friends since then and continue to be. And then when I asked Bob about his own work and one of his most memorable moments, he recognized that uh, he had read um, at an open mic at an ice cream parlor in West Concert and he had read a Sestina, inspired by an encounter in Greece. Afterwards, a young male student came to his seat in the audience and said, sir, that was the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. And Bob said, I was surprised and of course delighted to thank him. That sort of thing seldom happens, at least to me. <laughs> and so you never know, and sometimes when you're busy with all the rest of the workings, uh, we don't have opportunity to hear uh, the leaders ourselves. So please help me welcome, give a warm welcome to Bob Clausen as he shares his own poetry. I am a narrative poet, i.e. my poems generally tell stories, and, uh, but I lace them with lyricism, of course, it's, it's the job. But I also write lyrical poetry, and today I've brought a mix of both. And I thought I would begin with short poems because generally when you hear the word narrative poem, you think of a longer poem. We'll get to those, but I'll begin with short poems. I think most of you know uh, Robert Herrick's Upon Julia's Clothes. But if you don't, uh, it goes this way. When as in silks my Julia goes, then, then methinks how sweetly flows that liquefaction of her clothes. Now I've rewritten that in the language of modern American poetry, and my piece is called Traveling Music. A lot depends on how my Julia packs her slacks. <laughs> 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 
The mayfly emerges from the water, lays its eggs, and dies in about one day. It's lived a while underwater, but its, it's glory is just a day long. And I've written a, a haiku in which the mayfly, I, I urge the mayfly to see something that Michelangelo did and is currently um, on display in Florence. Mayfly, you should see Michelangelo's Matthew emerge from marble. Bird flu. I thought that that was what they were supposed to do. It's <laughs> a little roller coaster working here now. This one's a bit grim. Meat works. The cows thump on the killing floor. The heartbeat of the abattoir. This was the title of my first book. Um, it's a lyric, short. Nightbreak. At first light from the beach, all the white birds are black, scattering the last shards of darkness over the wind-mauled, glinting sea. I spent a lot of time in Nantucket, and each year out there, a, a Dutchman named Helmut Weymeyer, who summers among several beautifully landscaped Nantucket estates atop a storm-threatened bluff, funds a new but fruitless engineering project to foil the Atlantic Ocean to save the properties and their lush lawns from destruction by relentless erosion. He called one of those projects Stay Beach, and I responded, in this way. Stay, beach. As old Ahab chased the whale, Helmet too seeks his grail, not to stand up to his god, but to save with vengeance, sod. <laughs> I started out to write a double dactyl. That's a challenging little verse form, but I succumbed to a baseball ditty with this one. If you watch the Red Sox, you'll recognize the scene. Hit by pitch, 81st time. Eucalyptus, masochist, writhes in the dirt. Twisted fist, broken wrist, not even hurt. <laughs> this is a suite of poems about winter. And I think you remember winter. It was a season that preceded this lovely day. Um, and I'll close my short poems with these. There are three of them. Snow. Watch out when snow is blowing up, out through the window to the woods, because out's too far from slippers and steam off the bath, too far from brandy, but close to the wood to be out. Deer. Oh, dear, they're here again. An ear behind the weft of spruce against the snow, just left. That smear of stones, that twitch, that swish. Right there, the deer. Ice. Stand back when the trees wear sleeves of ice when wind, when limbs wheeze and crack, please stand back from the skylight. Stand back by the rack of wood, by the fire, with a book and a glass to rock and clink. Now we'll launch the uh, longer narratives. This one's called Grappling. Um, it's a military poem, and I've excised some of the military language, but that's the way it goes. A whelk, if you don't know, is a large seashell, somewhat like a conch. Um, and in this poem, the narrator reflects in a kind of stream of consciousness, but I think you'll hear it pretty clearly. Grappling, Sneed's River, pardon me, grappling. Begin again, Bob. <laughs> New River, 
Sneeds Ferry, North Carolina, circa 1950. The sergeant sets the throttle, troll. Your Marines, you'll take turns with the hooks. If we hook him and he surfaces, don't look at the colonel's eyes unless you want him watching you the rest of your goddamn lives. The colonel's bobbing, loon-wet head, nostrils gorged with algae. Rain for days, the estuarial gray's gone toffee brown, the marshes' grass mats decompose, shellfish strain decay. Squirrel rotting in the mess hall ceiling, sweet and sour soup. My first turn on the hooks, I say, we've caught a log. The log's lurch settles in my gut. It surfaces, threadbare, good year. A chopper wops overhead. He tasted it till pack silt drove his teeth past grimace tossed his SOSing tongue. The limb I'm hooked to now peels from the trunk. It's small, but turns like toweling in our wake. Four mushrooms sprout, fingers, then a thin black wrist, a black bicep, armpit, some lat. All I got is arm, a skinny black kid, come about. Throw it back. I relish gale surf, the rush to crackling rock, our rubber rafts scrunching sand. The grapple picks a piece of turquoise shirt and pectoral. Throw that back too. He's only five feet down, can't I just dive? Moonless trips across Traps Bay for heaps of crabs, hogs of beer, Sneed's Ferry's hook. The sergeant's on the radio. Roger, out. Kid, this ain't your day. Some smart flyboys found our man. That's it. Stow that grapple in your lap. Through outboard spray, I watched the harnessed swinging silhouette rise into the olive bird. The colonel's corpus leaves first class. Told Twyla that New River was the oldest in America. She didn't bite. I coil the rope. My hands ooze blood. I taste my finger, too much salt. Ashore, a crow rips gristle from a whelk. This is another poem about uh, salt water instead of sweet water. And, and it's a, I think you'll find, more pleasant poem. Toadfish. I prowl the pier, Nantucket scallop boat slopping on a northeast chop. Bait fists agitate, shimmer in a lamppost glare. A cloud of squid twinkles, disappears. Monkey rope, a dragger, bumps against black piling. Her dazzling fish froth, offals perfume, luring hungry stripers. For comfort, I'll fish in her lee, cozy close enough to hear the viscous snoring of the crew. You ever seen one of these? His throw nets rope with chain for weight. Homemade? He stares at me. Nobody's home when he made this. He spills a mottled, hunched head, huge mouth thunking fish upon the deck. Northern oyster toadfish, ups on us towel. Melville called the giant squid unearthly. I doubt he'd seen a toadfish. It cuddles up in poisoned mud among our litters, raises young in number 10 cans, worn tires. One glance into its eye reruns childhood reels of under bed and closet spooks. Don't touch it, I warn him. They crush oysters. He pokes at it again. 
you do some fishing? He toes at the slippery mound. You ever heard him call? Wake this town fast. Then slides it croaking down the deck. Loose fish, fast fish, straight out through the sluice. You know, they can walk. Clear across a flat. My daddy called them dancers. You could take a toadfish to the junior prom. I ain't kidding. They make great moms, better than bears, sing their babies to sleep, keep this town up. I know the mother leaves the brooding to the male who guards the nest. Carolina. He stares at me again longer this time. Ocracoke, how'd you know? How? Nobody sings like a banksman. This time, a smile. You sing out when you haul. It mollifies the rigor. You want to come on board? I skid off balance on his greasy deck. He offers me his hand. We lean against the bayside rail, waiting for the song. I was very fortunate to meet the poets uh, Alicia Stallings and Moira Egan in Greece, and they had just come from a swim, but it was evening, and they, and they had on terry cloth robes and the hair was all wet, beautiful, pale-skinned women. And they said, um, this is the hour when the pale women swim. <laughs> I was watching birds, and at the time, it was late for birds, and you could just see the change from swallows to bats, and the bats were filling this, this veil. I mention this because we witnessed the same phenomenon. There's a bit of didacticism in this. Um, and later captured two poems. Then it's the same trigger, to, so to speak, but different imaginations, different results. One a lyric, one a narrative. And I'm going to read Moira Egan's poem on the subject first and then follow it with mine. Mine is a sestina, hers is a standard lyric with rhyme form. It's called Limnal Hymn by Moira Egan for A.E. Stallings and R.J. Clausen. I know a man who wants to know the very hour when bats replace the tracings of swallows in the sky. When sonar echoes flowers, sights subsumed by ways of knowing. Light forgotten, listen. That moan you hear could be the farewell of a fisherman's boat. The ghost you tried to leave behind, who's here. Or Athena's owl waking, clearing her throat. This is not the hour for asking questions. Feel the moon rise, her diaphanous robe, taking substance from her brother, the sun, who turns away, slightly envious, cloak slung over shoulder beside reason and truth. In in-between time, mysteries undim, the sea calms, cools to an enemy blue. This is the hour when the pale women swim. Mine's entitled Bat and Swallow. And there's a bit of an Ovid in it and that there's a metamorphosis that I hope you hear. Bat and Swallow. Time when the pale girls swim. Where? I'm on a hotel balcony in Greece. Swallows grace the air, darting after bugs that buzz just a wing beat too slow in this evening space. The cats, the dogs, everything looks hungry here. I am a bit myself. I bat a fly off my nose. Swallows fly like bats. Bats perhaps with lesser glide, more wear on wings. Light fails. The least adept and hungriest of swallows give way to bats. A full moon swallows twilight, appears to suck the stars from space. From the patio below, perfumes. The buzz of students speaking Greek. 
the music's buzz, bazooki and guitar, a whining song, as a bat zooms the lamppost's moth throng. I clear a space to spread my blanket, lay my towel where I'll stretch stiff, veiny legs, my back, and swallow my belly's guilt. Rising with the moon, hungry, hungry to eat, hungry to dance, and hungering, yes, to drink red wine and likewise buzz the dancing girls. Their arms slow motion swallows wings. Mine, a little worn, one hiding my bat's face as I'd circle to a pale girl. She'd wear black like a swallow, and we'd fill the space's lamplight, the moon's penumbral glow, my space, between the time when pale girls swim and the hungriest of swallows at last gives way, no longer wary where the dark deceives and her alcoholic buzz slows her wing beats and her hands as she bats her hair aside. Her eyes are mine. Swallow, we are kin. We dance so close that the light swallows our pale faces as the moon the stars above spaces. Come then to my balcony above where bat and swallow can satisfy our strange hunger, where no mosquitoes will dare buzz our moist moonlit skin. We'll make feast where the cool tiles reflect the paling moon, where both bat and swallow feel their blood buzz, that perfect space, each satisfied yet hungry. And I'll finish with a poem entitled, The Story. The story escapes like fruit flies. Red-eyed, desperate to tell you last night's stuff, I blurt spatterings, wing beats, like kunai, but not the story. I swear, I shaped a story that began before I dreamt into it, where it caught me unaware in gray water, a heron fixing yellow eye on the eel in my fist. You, singing from Mahagoni. A moon of Alabama, we now must say goodbye. Marta, remember her? Setting the washer on second rinse while a mouse board cantaloupe swung in Cirque du Soleil without a ticket? But I can't remember enough to tell you how it played out so you too could grasp its horror and its loveliness. Thank you very much. Winter's fierce course calmed Gold crocus lights the dooryard. Come, let's celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> now I will do nothing but let colors limb the tale. I see pigments gossiping, soft, hard-edged, dark, bright. The spin of the weather vane marking the wind, palm palms of trees, quick marching waves, greetings of boats. I see the arc of the fisherman's fling, the sure leap of children after frogs, the flash of a pike cadging mayflies, the shadow of a bass guarding his young. The great blue heron with one leg lifted, its marble eye stalking a meal. The chestnut hairs on a mink slipping into the current, the silver wake of her tail. I see the sharp angled wings of gulls as they glide under clouds. On a branch over water, the strut of a white-collared kingfisher. 
in the water, a sentence of merganser ducklings, black letters teasing our eyes. I see the cliff face flaunting the scarlet bells of the windflower. On the beach, the green of wild mint in the gray rock pool puffs of a red wing bathing. I see the rack of the undertow when waves pull back foaming white, the water from Niagara Falls ever born. Light, shadow, color, shapes spreading from a vanishing point. Sky, water, land, mind, retina, hand. Thank you. To the glory of the one who framed me, who knit me together in my mother's womb, I give thanks for all of those questions, the answers to which I will never know. You know. That is enough. So I give up. I give up the search, but not the wonder. I give up the striving, but keep the grace, and most selfishly, the mercy, my undeserved gifts. I will seek ever after to offer them back as praise. Happy Easter.